have had the pleasure of serving with him on panels, being on panels that he moderated, um, see, you know, seeing him on panels when I was in the audience. And, and he, I mean, at the last Globecom I was at, was, was seemed to be on every panel that I think there was there. Um, and so we thought, you know, I mean, wh who's, who could we get to moderate this panel? And we were thinking and thinking, and like, wait, Amitava, the, the panel master. And so um, he, he also is, is catching a flight. And so he's going to leave uh, very sharply right after the panel. Uh, so don't be alarmed if he runs very quickly. But as a result, we're also going to end on time. So with that, uh, please join me in welcoming Amitabha. OK. Thanks, Robert and Jeff, and for inviting me to conduct this panel. It is really a pleasure and an honor. So the name of the panel is 5G Air Interface. And you know that 5G Air Interface, there was a seminal paper saying that is Air Interface dead? And everybody got really excited about that paper, and they started researching. And I'd like to congratulate Robert. People are researching because of his paper. And we are here. So. So, uh, so we have uh, four eminent uh, panelists here, uh, and you'll hear one more ring at 4.45. My cab driver will call me, so don't get alarmed. <laughs> so here is uh, Charlie, my good friend. He, is a, uh, he has been in 3GPP, he has a lot of patents, he's the VP of Samsung, he's a great guy to work with. We have uh, Mike Barrick. From who is the business development manager for Unrisu Wireless Portfolio, and I was glad to meet him in this summit. Then we have uh, Eduardo, uh, great, um, a great guy from Qualcomm, um, and uh, I have met him in my, uh, and he, he, we are really fortunate to have him. And finally, Ted, Ted, my good friend, and he drove all the way from. Uh, from New York to uh, Texas, you see, in his uh, 1970 Buick, a favorite car for Greg Gerhard, you see. Uh, uh, and uh, we are really happy to have uh, Ted. He is a pioneer in millimeter wave, and it, it, was, it is really a pleasure to have you here and to work with you. Uh, thank you, Ted. So with that, uh, uh, it, uh, now the panelists will have an opening statement, so we can go into the questions and introduce the topic of the panel. The, uh, as you have heard, there are a lot of great speakers, and uh, what they did is say they have covered all the topics. So, <laughs> so w in 5G, we are looking at frequencies below 6 gigahertz, above 6 gigahertz in centimeter wave and millimeter wave spectrum. So how to design a unified air interface across all these frequency bands. And it all depends upon the bandwidth. It all depends upon the channel, uh, how you design it. So that is the essence of this panel. So uh, going to 3GPP, this is the um, 3GPP timeline. So we start with the, um, the so there will be a channel modeling. Uh, so there will be a channel modeling group or channel modeling uh, investigation or study item, uh, which will start in 3GPP next year. Uh, there will be a requirement study item, and there will be evaluation of solutions. So the first phase one will be, is supposed to be completed by 2018, and the phase two of the specification by 2019. What will phase one comprise? It will initial 5G features. It will cater to most urgent commercial requirements. It will support bands up to 30 to 40 gigahertz, from sub-6 gigahertz to 30 to 40 gigahertz. Uh, optimize L1 for 100 megahertz or higher carrier bandwidth, because if you look at the spectrum, you'll not get 2 gigahertz of spectrum there. You'll get 100 megahertz, 200 megahertz, 400 megahertz spectrum. And then uh, lean carrier, flexible numerology, 1 millisecond latency. These are the requirements Ian talked about, and you know about it. Oh, OFDM is not dead. OFDM type waveforms. That will be the key guiding principle for phase one. Uh, specification completed in 2018. Phase two will be more interesting where we'll be delving into new features. We'll be delving into higher frequency band. It may so happen that higher frequency band is the way to go, you see. So we'll be looking at spectrum from 0.3 to 100 gigahertz, 1 to 2 gigahertz bandwidth at high millimeter wave band. 
will consider low PAPR waveforms because at high millimeter wave band, that is the thing we should do. And finally, the specification of that is supposed to be completed by 2019. And all these phase one and phase two are driven by the sports event in Korea and Japan, you see. So that's, uh, so, the, so I have divided into a couple of topics here. The first topic is channel modeling and measurements. I have a set of questions. I will ask each of the panelists to uh, have their views on these questions. So the first, so these are the set of questions and you can address any of these. So evaluation of 5G will need high confidence channel model from 6 to 100 gigahertz and even below 6 gigahertz. So will 6 to 100 gigahertz model be consistent with current models below 6 gigahertz? So this is the question. I'll start with Ted. Okay, thank you, Amitava. It's great, great to be here. And 13 years ago, uh, when we started the center and the symposium with uh, Jeff and Robert and Sanjay and the rest of the faculty, for me it's very exciting to be back here and see what it's become and to see some dear friends, some who were here for the very first uh, uh, summit. So um, to answer a few of those questions, Amitava, uh, first I hope everyone is following a website which gives you an idea of how fast this is coming. In fact, I'll predict now that we'll actually accelerate the phase one to be six months faster than 2017. Uh, the FCC about one year ago this week asked for public comments on the use of spectrum above 24 gigahertz. And in the past year, there have been approximately 100 public filings. I encourage all of you to go to the website. Uh, if you put in your search engine, FCC 14-177, 14-177, you'll see all the major companies in the world. You'll see UT Austin and NYU Wireless with public comments. I think Chairman Wheeler, I hope our government uh, doesn't disappoint. I think you're gonna see the FCC announce a week from today a uh, notice of proposed rulemaking to get out in front of the World Radio Conference, which starts next month in Geneva. And I think you're going to see the world very quickly move to millimeter wave. So I think we're going to see this go very, very fast, much faster than what a lot of people think around the world. So let's see if next Friday the U.S. steps out and uh, authorizes the first frequencies in the world for mobile with a notice of proposed rulemaking. Very exciting time, so check out FCC 14-177. The channel models, uh, we've been doing a lot of work at NYU and even uh, when I was here at uh, UT Austin and even at Virginia Tech uh, in the 1990s, we were looking at millimeter waves. I have to tell you the channel is wonderfully similar and wonderfully different at millimeter waves. The similarities are that large-scale path loss doesn't change very much with distance. In fact, most of the loss in wireless is in your first meter of propagation from the antenna. So the myth that Farouk talked about today, uh, the belief that millimeter wave is somehow much more lossy, it really is a myth. It's not terribly more lossy. One thing I've been amazed about, and for those of you involved in standards work, uh, which 3GPP and the ITU have done, which I think has created a big disservice to the world, and I think we have a chance to correct in this channel modeling effort, is that uh, the propagation people that go out and measure signals sometimes get a bad name because the models that are created by the people that put the standards together very fast, they just fit a bunch of data to a bunch of curves. And so you get these weird models that look like 67.3 plus 10 log 2.8 D to the N over F. They don't make any physical sense. Yet if you're an information theorist or a communication theorist or an academic who wants to do analysis and closed form expressions, it'd be nice to have propagation models that have a physical meaning, an intuitive meaning, and are also easy to use. So you'll see in some of those public comments in the last few weeks especially, we've contributed, mm -hmm. and I hope 3GPP participants will realize that you can do very accurate modeling 
with fewer model parameters, with the same accuracy and much better closed form analytical solutions than what the industry has used. So, so the, uh, Ted, the question is, will 6 to 100 gigahertz model be consistent with current bonds? Yes, policy? so I hope we, so the answer is, you have more resolution, more bandwidth, you need new models. But you can use the new modeling framework that we've discovered and put them back into the older frequency models. The bottom line is we have a chance to correct some of the uh, errors and bring back physically based models that have much more time resolution and much more sensitivity. Charlie, you want to contradict it? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a very difficult contra contradict with the history of the millimeter wave channel model being here. So it's, uh, um, I think uh, Ted really shared a wonderful sort of a, a brief history of what's going on and uh, Samsung was very happy to be the first partner uh, with Ted uh, in, in this journey of uh, coming up with channel model measurement uh, starting from the days when he was still here in Texas in Austin. Um, yeah, we, we, we think this uh, millimeter wave definitely is very important for the future. It's one of the uh, key drivers for 5G. Um, and, and we've been working with Ted and uh, other partners the uh, last few years, taking measurements, building mm. sounders, and, and extracting models out of that. So definitely we, we will continue to do that. Um, I mean, if you look at uh, uh, information we have today, so um, there, there's a lot of integration that, as Ted mentioned, there's a lot of similarity um, you know, for the channel above and below six gigahertz. Uh, of course, there will be differences as well. So I think when you talk about the consistency, then I think uh, uh, some of the discussion we have in 3GPP was to make sure that when you cross that boundary of six gigahertz, it's not, it's, there's no magic there, right? That's just a number we put there to separate these two groups. So there is no sudden jump in the behavior. So, you, you know, if you deploy a system at 5.9, it works, and all of a sudden, if it's 6.1, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of behavior we want to avoid. So that's part, part of what you say about consistency. Yeah. Having said that, there is some differences in behavior. Uh, and that's another area that, uh, of active uh, research and interest. Uh, I mean, I can, I can think of quite a few. For example, the uh, um, spatial consistency will become more important. Human shadowing. Vehicle shadowing, that's probably not so important for conventional low frequency. It becomes a lot more important because the wavelengths become so small comparable, uh, compared to the size of a human and vehicle. And there's uh, other things such as diffusion effects and so on that's, that we need to take an extra look now in, in higher frequency. So. Okay, so uh, one thing you must realize that the WRC 2015 will focus on frequencies below 6 gigahertz, whether they will allocate new frequencies. And the first phase of 3G PP, the standardization, will be below 6 gigahertz. And in China is mainly interested in below 6 gigahertz. So. And there are different opinions on this, and WRC 2019 will consider frequencies above 6 gigahertz, so just for your information. Mike, you have any follow-up comments? One additional point, uh, device to device was just standardized in release 12. I think that will continue on into 5G. Uh, but in terms of propagation and channel modeling, that creates a, a, a different environment where you might be propagating from a person to a person or a person to a vehicle. And I think because of that, the channel models might be slightly different. But agree with all the other comments so far also. Okay, this is a um, um, question for Eduardo is that we, uh, we know that penetration loss increases with frequency. And do you think uh, there's a break point where you have to deploy a separate outdoor and indoor uh, system? Because now you can cover outdoor from indoor and also indoor from outdoor. So uh, your thoughts on that and any previous thoughts on our previous questions? Okay, I'll start with a, just kind of a comment on what Charlie mentioned. I, I, I agree with him that it would be desirable to have the consistency that he mentioned in terms of, you know, the six gigahertz is not, there's no magic about that. So if you, you go across that boundary, it would be desirable to have consistent uh, channel models. Uh, but on the other hand, the other point I want to make is it's, it's desirable, but not necessarily uh, 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 crucial because uh, there are some established models that work well for uh, below six gigahertz, and there's a lot of measurements for centimeter wave and millimeter wave. And if you actually look at the at the boundary, 
of 6 gigahertz or even between 6 and, and 20 uh, uh, gigahertz, there, there aren't a lot, uh, we don't have a lot of uh, uh, spectrum being considered. Uh, so from a practical point of view, in terms of uh, having an impact, a material impact in, in uh, air interface design, I don't think that consistency, consistency, consistency across 6 gigahertz is going to actually be that important. Uh, to your, um, to your uh, point about uh, propagation loss, uh, yeah, so I guess depend, you know, as you go up in frequencies, uh, you know, we're gonna, in some cases, you're gonna have uh, to deploy outdoor systems uh, and perhaps not get penetration uh, indoors, and, and that's a, you know, it's a, a known factor, but also depends on a lot of things. So it's not just the frequency, it depends on the deployment, the, but the materials, the building materials, and all, all of that. Uh, for you know systems where you deploy indoors, uh, then you know the you know the the the, the frequency uh, increase in there. I think it's going to be a uh, an important consideration. But then you have to look at other things too, diffraction and losses and other things. And we will have to kind of uh, for any system that goes up in frequency like millimeter wave or centimeter wave, we're going to have to kind of up. If we're doing deployments indoor, we're probably going to have to deploy multiple uh, access points. Yeah, because I have seen measurements at 2 gigahertz and 28 gigahertz penetration loss through metallized glasses. Both are, yeah. you can't cover Depending inside, you'll see. So it depends upon the, so Ted, do you have any comments on this? Yeah, it's definitely tough to penetrate buildings when you get up uh, above 10 gigahertz or so. The metallized uh, glass, the brick. Even floor to floor, we, did, we just uh, published the first comprehensive study of millimeter wave measurements in, indoors at 28 and 73 gigahertz. Uh, we posted it for the FCC. And what's amazing is you cannot even go from floor to floor at 28 gigahertz using you know, 25 dB directional gain antennas on, on both sides. I mean, it's very, very lossy. So you're going to see separate systems. Uh, indoors as outdoors, I believe. And, and actually, this will be a good thing. It'll pr provide natural interference protection, which will improve capacity and define the cells. But it's a totally different world from today where you can expect your Wi-Fi access point to go upstairs or downstairs or between floors or cellular to get in the building. You know, in, in Korea, where there's huge fiber build-out, they use a lot of outside-in strategy. The cellular carriers actually put cell sites outside the building to penetrate the buildings. It's going to be very difficult to do that in millimeter wave. So I'll entertain two questions from the audience, two tough questions for the panelists. Any questions on channel modeling? No questions? No tough questions? OK. OK, go ahead. And yeah. I'll, I'll answer first. Great question. Do you need directionality on both sides of the link? The answer is no, especially if you're looking for a narrow bandwidth, high power control signal. I think a lot of synchronization will involve adaptive beam widths, where, say, the mobile can use an omni antenna and then very quickly move to very directional when they find where and when they're trained for, for uh, directional beam forming, for example. But for, for High payload communications, you're going to want as much gain as you can get because you lose, you know, you lose 20 log f path loss in the first meter as you go up higher in frequencies. What do others think? One more question. Well, uh, okay, go ahead. I can probably add a little bit to what Ted was saying. Uh, definitely, in general, the, the principle uh, Ted mentioned is very much true. So coverage is always a function of the data rate you're trying to transmit. So for control, it's a lot easier compared to data. But if you look at some of the existing designs, I think it's really also a function of which frequency you are looking at. Um, at least some of the existing designs we saw is uh, counting on even for the control, also using the, uh, the, the beamforming at both the transmit and receiver side, for example, the Y gig system that we, we have today. And the other, other frequencies we don't know yet. I think jewelry is still out. I think we don't have a spec yet uh, for 28, 39. 
but I, I wouldn't be surprised that you see uh, a combination of these different technologies going forward. Mike, any? Uh, Eduardo? One more tough question. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, anybody else? Okay. So the question was, what is the Doppler frequency effect and multi-user MIMO? And just uh, and as you go high up in frequency, and this relates to also phase noise problems. Yeah, so yeah, ahead. and phase noise and, and actually uh, time slot, you know, time slot selection. Basically, Doppler will go up linearly, so your time slot size has to decrease linearly which means you have to now use smaller time slots, but the data rate will be higher, so your payload will still be as good or better. And so it's really just a question of synchronizing, whether you're uh, doing uh, multi-user MIMO or uh, uh, directional beamforming, you know, you'll have these, these smaller time slots. But I don't see Doppler as a, as a big problem at all, because everything kind of shrinks in the size. And, and, uh, you know, as oscillators get better and phase noise gets better, I, I, th I don't think it'll be an issue. You want to? Yeah. Um, um, yeah, I just have, I mean, just a, a, another question on a related topic. Um, maybe you would like this to So there was all this great work done on site-specific propagation modeling, like from your group, over many years. And we see that blockage is so critically important, but yeah. why are we not seeing new discussion of site-specific propagation? I mean, it seems like we have to have it. No one here has discussed Great question. Yeah. I love that question. Well, here's the problem. This is, this, is, this is the standards body thinking. We did it this way 10 years ago. Let's keep things the way it was. 3GPP, we're going to keep the legacy. And, and the fact is millimeter wave is very different because it's site-specific really makes a lot of sense. Now that said, you can't do site-specific on uh, five different buildings and th say that's the standard or five different cities. So statistical models really have their place, I think, in standards. I'd just like to see those statistical models for small scale and large scale channel models have a physical basis, a fundamental physical basis, where we can say why the model parameters are why they are. So if someone in Tokyo and someone in Europe and South America all do a channel model, they're all using a referenceable model that has a physical basis. Right now, there's just it looks like random numbers. Okay, so statistical or map-based model, Eduardo? Oh, um, I think statistical will be easier too. Yeah, that's uh, my opinion too. <laughs> everybody agrees, so everybody agrees in the panel. Not map-based, <laughs> it is statistical. Okay. Now, but for deployment, deployment will be a different yeah. issue. When you deploy a network, you're going to use a lot of site-specific, and, and, and that's how you'll deploy. So, build them up. so moving on, we'll move from channel models to air interface design. Now, this is, so what will be the minimum bandwidth below 6 gigahertz centimeter and millimeter? That's my first question. And remember, the, the requirement is 10 gigabits peak rate and uh, 100 megabits cell edge rate everywhere. Uh, it can be 1 gigabits too. So what kind of bandwidth do you think uh, will be below 6 gigahertz centimeter wave and millimeter wave? Uh, start with Eduardo this time. Oh, um, well, for below six, I think we're going to see uh, a very low minimum bandwidth, actually, because we need to, as part of the requirements, we're going to be looking at uh, uh, very low, low power kind of a mm. type of IoT device, so mm. we need to support very low bandwidth. Um, for, obviously, for centimeter wave and millimeter wave, we're going to have to, you know, the minimum bandwidth will be much higher, perhaps 100 megahertz at a minimum um, or more. But uh, 5G, we are designing the system, uh, the requirements is the same, below 6 gigahertz, centimeter wave and millimeter wave. And as you can see, if they open up new bands, 4 point, I don't know, 3.7 to 4.5, you will get some bandwidth, you get 500, 600, 1 giga, gigahertz of bandwidth. So. So it, it will not be a 20 megahertz system as you go to 5G, I think, below 6 gigahertz. Charlie? I mean, definitely uh, for 5G, even for below 6 gigahertz, we, we need to look at a larger bandwidth support. Uh, I'm still debating whether 80 is a better number or 100. Part of the reason is Wi-Fi is already using 80. Some of the existing band 
uh, in, in 5 gigahertz is 80 uh, or, or multiple of 20 or 40. But I think maybe uh, I can understand from uh, what, what uh, Eduardo said earlier, uh, there's also a difference between the uh, network bandwidth and the terminal device bandwidth. For device side, definitely, I mean, we have to support different categories of uh, capabilities. So some of them, especially for IoT purpose, could be very small to make it low power, low cost. But you know, for, for some of the mobile broadband applications, when we have a, a larger bandwidth. But from the network side, we definitely need to go higher bandwidth. Mike, any? Uh, I guess my thinking is that 5G will be very scalable. So for the IoT part, you might actually use different waveforms, different bandwidths on the device side. I understand the network side would be the same universally. Uh, I think narrowband IoT uses one PRB. Possibly that would continue on to 5G on the device side uh, and then scale up for other applications that may, may need more bandwidth. Uh, in the IoT domain. So this question is not here, but uh, for massive MTC application, do we really need 5G? So question to Charlie, anybody? I mean, I, I, think, uh, I think we need it. Why? Because uh, if you look at what we have today, it's very difficult to support a heterogeneous set of requirements. Some of them are you know, mobile broadband, some of them are IoT with very low data rate, low power power requirements. So today the waveform we have, the infrastructure, network architecture, everything was not designed to support this uh, very vast different set of uh, requirements. But we have this in-band uh, narrowband IoT which, uh, which can be multiplexed for a narrowband LTE, you see. We have that already or we are discussing yeah, we are. that. Right, right. Yeah, well, but I, I tend to agree with Charlie that there is an opportunity here to start uh, fresh and design mm -hmm. uh, something that will be more kind of optimized and really kind of uh, when we talk about massive IoT, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, for 10 years from now, uh, then we have a system that will be kind of um, optimized for that kind of uh, scenario, whereas LTE even in the, in, the, in the current developments in, in you know, narrowband IoT type of developments they're discussing now, um, it's still, the fact of the matter is, is still an afterthought, right? So we have, we, when we start designing LTE, for, you know, we, we didn't have that use case in mind, and now we're adapting it. So That's right, and, and we have to build a framework where the future companies that we haven't even thought about yet in IoT, in vehicle monitoring, in home monitoring, and personal care. Uh, there are new companies that are going to have to use the future of wireless, and that's not designed right now in LTE or 4G. So, and you think about the scale of the number of wireless devices that we have now in our home compared to five years ago. If you just think about five years ago, how many iPhones or Apple Watches or Android devices or wireless printers you had and what you have now, and, and you think in the future, we need a new landscape, and so you have to have this heterogeneity built in to the standard. I think it's going to have to come. So the air interface should be flexible enough with different TTI supporting and different numerology. That's yeah, okay. and the power level issue is really key. You know, bandwidth, power. Uh, you know, we don't have that in today's commercial cellular wireless. We don't have it in Wi-Fi. You know, Bluetooth gets to it with low power, but we need to rethink that, and we have an opportunity in 5G. Now, this is a difficult question. The next question is that how will you differentiate between LTE advanced and 5G below 6 gigahertz? I understand 5G above 6 gigahertz with respect to spectral efficiency. Particularly, you say you can do lean carrier. That's fine. You can do massive MIMO. LTE does massive MIMO. Up to, it will do up to 64 ports uh, in release uh, 14. So uh, what is the game changer? How can you improve? Yeah, I understand you can improve the spectral efficiency by maximum two times. So what are the important features if you want to increase by three times? Is since, it possible? Since you asked below six gigahertz, I'm going to pull a Robert Heath here. All my eggs are in the millimeter wave basket. I'm not interested in below six gigahertz. <laughs> Charlie. Right. I mean, definitely, there, there, I think you, you get it very, very clearly uh, that there will be a lot of uh, uh, overlap 
uh, you know, both in terms of uh, the use case as well as in terms of the uh, technology that we will see going forward in the next few years, uh, comparing the LTE advanced evolution versus the 5G new rat for below 6 gigahertz. As you said, above, it's, it's not an issue at all. Um, so, uh, th again, the jury is still out, but we do see that there's a few areas where maybe uh, innovation can still uh, make a big difference when it comes to new waveforms, new codec. Uh, different ways of designing, for example, our, uh, our TTIs today is designed such, such, such that it's, it's, it's very dependent over time. So, it, you know, the HRQ process was designed so that you have this very rigid four millisecond. Uh, you know, after you transmit something, you expect uh, ACNAC to come back. That's part of a, a reason that we cannot design this low latency communication very easily in cellular networks. And some of that we can we can probably have a new thinking starting from uh, scratch. So that's where we see opportunities are. Uh, new waveform, uh, more self-contained transmission, and new code, codes. That's another big area I think uh, is innovation possible. Mike and um, Eduardo, if you want to add, how can you improve the spectral efficiency by three times? Two times, probably it is achievable, <laughs> below six. Um, well, Mike, my, my comment on, on the differentiation, uh, I think Obviously, LTE will continue to evolve. There are some uh, new features being added. We discussed a lot of, in the morning about uh, unlicensed spectrum. Um, there are efforts around uh, supporting, better supporting uh, IoT type of devices and, and so on. But if you think about it, LTE was designed with, uh, you know, a particular application, mobile broadband in, uh, in mind at that time with 10 megahertz, 20 megahertz channels in mind. Um, and I think there is a, an opportunity for 5G to differentiate um, with basically a more integrated uh, uh, air interface design that would support you know, the high reliability, the low latency, uh, the higher bandwidth, so uh, uh, massive MIMO uh, techniques. So I think there is, uh, while LTE you know, continue to advance, uh, 5G sub six gigahertz will also have an opportunity to differentiate and, and over time, uh, justify uh, net, uh, operators and the networks, it will be easy to justify the replacement of the techn uh, LT technology with the new 5G uh, air interface. So um, uh, to the panelists, how excited are you with this new modulation techniques? NOMA and SCMA, which is sparse code division, code multiple access, how excited are you about that? I guess my feeling is OFDMA on the downlink would probably continue for several years, including LTE and 5G. Um, and at some point, uh, for different applications, possibly would, would split off. Uh, and one of the other modulations may become prevalent for millimeter wave. But uh, others are more experts on millimeter wave than I am. You know, we found two very exciting things that I don't think the world realizes yet about millimeter waves. The first very exciting thing that differentiates millimeter wave from anything we've ever had in wireless is the amount of polarization discrimination that exists in the channel. That is, you can take a directional antenna with high gain and flip the polarization 90 degrees and get 20 to 30 dB of isolation in line of sight. And even in non-line of sight, you can still get 15 to 20 dB of, of polarization diversity, that is discrimination. 20 dB is a big attenuation where you could look at interference cancellation techniques and basically get double the capacity than exists today. And you really can't do that in today's handset, but this is coming to millimeter wave. That, that's, you know, times two in capacity for free on the antenna is a big deal. The other remarkable thing we we found and we published in December of last year is that in millimeter wave, this is very different than today. You can have a directional antenna, and this is why I'm pretty excited about directional beam forming, where you actually just use you know, spotlight beams or flashlight beams, I think you used the term. What you find is in most cases, when you use very directional uh, antennas, you get minimum and sometimes no multipath delay spread which means the whole issue that OFDM addressed, which was trying to turn the channel into a flat fading channel, and you get MIMO with the tones, 
you basically don't even need to worry about equalization with directionality. And I'm very excited about the prospect of a whole new kind of, uh, kind of back to the future, an old modulation coming back, where CDMA or, or some just single carrier uh, type techniques or multi-carrier CDMA with directional antennas where you're actually exploiting the fact that when you point to the strongest signal, you have virtually no multipath to worry about. There's no diversity which can give you the MIMO gain. So I think there's a whole wide open field for older modulations to come back once you know the channel to start looking at when you exploit high directional beams, the fact that you actually minimize multipath and now have a flat fading channel over wide, wide bandwidths, 50, 100 megahertz. Okay, one uh, last question before I go to the audience is that all this small cell deployment, you see, especially in the US, we don't have fiber to the home, you see, to lay fiber is, uh, dark fiber is very expensive. So you need wireless backhaul. So what, so if you have, if you densify the networks, you need a lot of small cells, you have to have a very reliable backhaul. So do you have a, both a backhaul story and a front haul story for massive mine? So th this is the key, right? Without a backhaul, without wireless backhaul, it is very difficult, you see, unless you have fiber like J Japan and Korea. So any, any comments from the panelists on that? I think that's a big deal. I think that's what American carriers and European carriers, the countries that don't have as big a build out of uh, backbone fiber are really gonna wrestle with. I think that's going to determine a lot of the value of the spectrum, actually. And so I think with the biggest fiber, if you've got the biggest fiber backhaul install in the right places, that's, that's critical to all this, uh, to 5G, I think, whether you're at uh, mm. below or above 6 gigahertz. Any, any comments? Uh, for, uh, I guess in terms of Backhaul, front haul. My understanding is it would be more front haul for a 5G type network, since the network's distributed with Cloud RAN. Uh, I think currently, for for current networks, uh, Cipri's being used quite a bit, but I don't think it it's, uh, has enough bandwidth to be able to support 5G. Uh, but something like 100 gig or multi 100 gig Ethernet might be something that's used for for the front haul. Eduardo. Um, um, I was just going to say that um, I think the, you know we have already um, backhaul solutions that are in the millimeter uh, waves kind of a, a frequency bands. I think then there is an opportunity there also to have a more integrated uh, design mm -hmm. where we we'll support access as well as a yeah. backhaul. Dynamic uh, TD, yeah. With a more scalable, yeah, uh, design. Uh, so I think that's also a, a very good opportunity for 5G. Charlie, any? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, the backhaul, wireless backhaul support for, uh, for the small cells has been an issue in the last 10 years. That's part of the reason small cell has not gained as much momentum as initially expected. So uh, there's a lot of economic reasons behind that. But I, I guess, uh, you know, when it comes to 5G and massive MIMO, there's an additional issue if we want to support this cloud RAM based approach. And w what do we do? I think the traditional thinking of front, front hall solution um, actually have a slightly different opinion. I don't think that's scalable. We, we just don't have that kind of inf infrastructure to support that. We have to look for areas of additional, uh, more technology innovation, see where the smart partition is to allow us to build this uh, cloud solution that does not require 100 gig, uh, you know, one microsecond latency going forward. It has to do with a more, much, much lower requirement, maybe um, that's more affordable and more, more feasible going forward. Okay, questions from the audience. Again, I need tough questions. Uh, <laughs> and Tony. I'll give you a really tough question. Yeah. <laughs> I think you let the panelists off too, too lightly when you ask the question. How do we get three times the link spectrum you know, with all due respect to my old colleague, Aguado, there, you know, I, I respect him quite a lot. But then all the technology he listed there were really kind of not linked spectrum efficiency. It has to do with system spectrum efficiency. So the question remains to the panelists. And I take head out, because he put all his eggs in, no, either way. <laughs> <laughs> so the question remains to the panelists. How do you get three times linked 
financial impact will be efficient. Yeah, that, that's true. I, I let the panelists go because I am in the U.S. And if you look at the press, they don't follow up the questions with the politicians. <laughs> like, <laughs> like in BBC, you see in England, they follow up with tough questions. So go ahead, answer the question. Or well, maybe we follow up with a, with a question. <laughs> what do we mean by increasing spectrum? <laughs> uh, so um, uh, I think there will be... Uh, you know, some of the techniques that I think we, we can use. I think uh, interference, in, in, uh, enhanced interference management techniques uh, are what probably... What we're trying to get is system spectral efficiency. The yeah. idea is link spectral efficiency gain of three times. Yeah, so obviously that from a link perspective, then we, we start getting some limitations, right, in terms of I think the systems today are pretty efficient already. Yeah. So um, we can get a little bit more, but I don't think we're going to get three times. Now, with uh, yeah. massive MIMO and other techniques, now you're going to say there are a system, this is also system level uh, uh, techniques, uh, then you can, you can get some uh, maybe two times, three times. Combining uh, some very good. system level techniques. I think uh, uh, that's because in, as you increase the number of antennas, you see, we go from 16 to 64, you see the, uh, the, the performance improvement is not linear with respect to spectral efficiency and edge rate. You can add all these comp techniques, you see, you can get 20, 30, 40% improvement, not, it is difficult to get 3x, you see, that's. Uh, any, any other question? Uh, okay, hi, Yen. Oh yeah, Wi-Fi is vitally needed. Uh, you know, as I think Gerhardt said, 90% of the carrier traffic's being offloaded to Wi-Fi today. We 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 vitally need Wi-Fi. In fact, my hope is that uh, the FCC next week, my hope is in their notice of proposed rulemaking, not only specify millimeter wave frequency bands, but also hint at a very large unlicensed spectrum offering. In fact, my, my hope and my intuition is that over the next couple of years, we're going to start to see multi gigahertz of unlicensed spectrum come on board, whether they augment existing 60 gigahertz or whether they go up to 95. My hope is, uh, I'm hoping that the FCC gets over that 95 gigahertz ceiling that's been stopping them. And I think they've heard enough public comments at 14-177, where maybe now they're thinking above 100 gigahertz. You're going to hear that talked about WRC next month. You're going to hear a lot of proposals to go up to 1,000 gigahertz carrier frequency. They're going to start talking about that next month. U.S. has to be there. Definitely, they'll always be unlicensed. There, ne there needs to be much more unlicensed to keep up with uh, the demand, just uh, like there needs to be more license spectrum. That's my opinion. Yeah, definitely, Wi-Fi will be a very important part of the solution. I mean, 5G is not just for cellular. 5G is for all the what? radio together. It's a unified network that we are considering. Of course, I mean, Wi-Fi still have a lot of room for improvement as well when we are talking about all these three times uh, improvements. By the way, Anthony, I think the link capacity improvement is important, but I think it's really more important to do the system capacity improvement. Well, I'm so, I'm so, uh, I'm just yeah. yeah. And where did they get that number? <laughs> where, where did ITU get no, that? They didn't get that number from us. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> okay. Okay, I'll uh, go to the next set of questions, massive MIMO, right? So here is a speculative question. Below 6 gigahertz centimeter wave and millimeter wave, how many antenna elements will be there? <laughs> so I want specific, just... <laughs> And it is being recorded. I'll play it after <laughs> 10 years. So, so. Infrastructure and yeah, mom, yeah, both. How many antenna elements will a 5G system support below 6 gigahertz at centimeter wave, say 6 to 30 gigahertz and above 30 gigahertz? Below 6 gigahertz on the handset, we'll get up to... Uh, well, eight, eight's a stretch, but I'll say eight on the handset, and uh, we'll go up to 64 
128 maybe if we're in a big, if we own a billboard and we make it an antenna. Uh, we're gonna see thousands of elements up at millimeter wave, thousands, 1024, 2048, uh, 28 gigahertz and above. And you're, uh, Samsung's already got 32 elements working at 28 gigahertz in their prototype. That was last year, they're probably up to 64 in the handset. So we're gonna see hundred, hundreds of elements in the handset <laughs> at millimeter wave, especially when we get to E-band. <laughs> Thousands of antenna elements at the base station. Excellent, excellent. Uh, Charlie. So, uh, definitely more than where we have today. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow, uh, that, that was hard. <laughs> wow. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> that is a Bush answer, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> So, you know, it's, you, you really scared me. Answer. You're going to play this back <laughs> 10 years from now. So, um, so I think that there is a, for below 6 gigahertz, we already see clear indications, right? The increasement in the antenna number will be focused more on the base station side. So you're really counting on the multi-user uh, MIMO benefit. So the terminal side will, will probably stay at 2 or 4 at most. Mm -hmm. But on the base station side, we're seeing Really suiting, we're already specifying 16 antenna, but we also saw a lot of the uh, prototypes working on 32, 64, even 128. Now going above 6 gigahertz, honestly, I, I think uh, yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, we don't have a very clear understanding yet whether we can build something that's 1,000 antenna or not. Uh, it definitely, theoretically, we see that it's possible, and we really want that, uh, uh, this antenna beamforming gain of 30 dB to be there to help us. But we also saw some of the issues with la very large amount of antennas. Sometimes uh, there's a feed loss, there's also the phase uh, inc inconsistency that comes with this very large panel. So there's a lot of technical issues to be resolved uh, in the millimeter wave side for us to realize that uh, vision. I mean, right now we can do probably 64, 128. We can comfortably say that we can do that. Mike? You know, I think on the terminal side, Thinking of a smartphone, yeah, I think eight antennas, I'd agree with Ted. Um, but you might be able to put uh, many different antennas into a, an, an automotive type platform, um, many more than eight, and, and get much better performance because of that. Mm -hmm. Or maybe into a jacket where you could fit many different antennas. Mm -hmm. Other things could be used outside of the smartphone form factor. Um, so because of that, you might be able to get many more antennas. Uh, below six gigahertz um, in the centimeter wave, millimeter wave, of course, it would scale up from there. Uh, on, and on the base station side, uh, you know, many different antennas in millimeter waves, uh, phased array, and, and uh, I think that the idea of a distributed network with distributed radiators that are controlled in phase um, could be something, uh, you know, a sparsely populated array built through a city. It could be a concept to be built on. It, it, um, and with that, you'd ha you might have um, you know, semi-densely populated metro areas uh, that are essentially an antenna. Um, Eduardo? Well, I tend to agree with the, the panelists. So I think with below six, uh, you know, we already see some indication we can get, you know, four uh, mm -hmm. antennas. And by the way, if we have multiple antennas already uh, because you consider uh, different um, uh, bands and you know Wi-Fi. There was so many antennas in those devices, and uh, obviously at some point you could you see potential gains of going to four and could potentially go to eight. But then at some point you get some diminishing uh, returns and also the 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 form the form factor the the the, the real estate kind of a space that we have to to accommodate becomes a, a, a bit of a challenge. Of course, uh, if you go to different form factors, you can explore a little more. On the, on the millimeter wave uh, uh, side, obviously we're gonna be able to support a lot more antennas, but uh, another aspect to, uh, also related to um, uh, blockage that was mentioned earlier, uh, for um, you know, small form factors like smart smartphones, even for millimeter wave, as we think about arrays, we're also gonna have to think about diversity of arrays inside the phones because, you know, depending in different ways, depending on how you hold the phone, you know, you completely block the antenna so you can't rely on, you know, on a single location. Uh, so that's also another consideration. 
Okay, so one last question before I go to the audience on massive MIMO is there are three architectures, like below six gigahertz, you know, baseband architectures, where you have a one trans receiver per stream uh, uh, and uh, one ADC. Um, so whereas if you go to RF architecture, you see there is a lot of power loss, so you have one ADC and you do the beam forming in RF, then somewhere you have the, do the uh, hybrid architecture where you have the beam forming weights both in baseband and, uh, and an RF. But the question is different because there is an ADC problem as you go to higher bandwidths, you can't have, like, you can't have a baseband architecture. So my question is, with one bit ADC, you can do that. You can do a full baseband architecture at, at millimeter wave. And Robert is doing very good work on one bit ADC. So will one bit ADC ever be possible with this huge sampling rate of uh, 300 uh, gigahertz? So that's the question to the panelist. You know, one bit ADC worked really well with CDMA. And so with the right modulation, uh, you know, I think it could work. Uh, Charlie, you agree with that? Uh, which part? One bit ADC? Or yeah, one, one bit ADC. And so uh, uh, probably Robert is the right person to answer yeah. that question. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I mean, it's, uh, I think bottom line is we. I firmly believe whenever possible we should do all digital. All so that's where that's where the, the best uh -huh. use of the system dimension is. That's where you get the best uh, spectrum efficiency. I'll force this question to Gerhard because uh, he is <laughs> also an expert in. So what is your view, Gerhard, on this? So my view is very simple. We can build one-bit ADCs, Schmidt Uh, will Qualcomm buy that? Uh, will develop a one bit ADC at millimeter wave? Um, why not? But, <laughs> uh, That's but, good. But I think uh, there are, we have to study uh, the different alternatives and see which one is going to actually be uh -oh. the best. Right. Okay, very good. I, I, uh, I just want to add uh, Amitawa. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think it's important to understand not only whether it's doable, but also understand what are we losing by doing that. So that's part of what I think I agree also with that, Dorado. That we need to do more study. Much in terms of right. Channel capacity. Exactly. Shown that, right? So it's not a loss in channel capacity. We just have to redesign our modulation. It's not a loss in link capacity, but do we lose in the system capacity? That part I'm not sure yet. Mike, any thoughts? Sorry. Okay, question from the audience now. This one there? Okay. Thank you for the panel. Very interesting. Uh, can anybody address the cost of this system? Because if you have 128 antennas, for example, you need 128 PAs. And uh, so this is really the power consumption now. So you, you do get a really great bit per energy per bit, but then you jack it up in, in the front end. So uh, any ideas? Uh, that is full baseband beam forming, by the way. So, I think they need to be phase lock PAs too, which even makes it correct, more difficult. Correct. But uh, we are talking about this 128 at uh, high high bands. You see where you have um, just um, one A to D uh, uh, per beam. You see. This is an exciting area, I think, for uh, antenna and front-end design. I think you're going to see a lot of hybrid antenna structures evolve where there are multi-elements tied to a single PA or tied to a single signal processing element so that you get some gain by the physical clustering of elements and have less to control, less to provide power. So there'll be a trade-off between the 
gain that you can get, the physical size and the uh, architecture of the hybrid approach. I think that's a very exciting area that we never were able to look at at two, three gigahertz because things were just too large. But uh, I think that's an open area and, and people are working on it, I'm sure. Okay, uh, Robert. <laughs> we're we're going to get we're going to solve it because we yeah, solved yeah. it below six gigahertz yeah, yeah. with Wi-Fi. We have yeah. multi-band Wi-Fi. We'll solve it. Charlie will solve it. Right? I don't know. Qualcomm, Qualcomm will solve it. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't make phones. <laughs> so the so the question was: So you have five G below six gigahertz centimeter wave and millimeter wave. How will you put all this technology in one phone? That, that's the, or shall it be multiple devices? See, so. Well, look, already we have, what, 10 radios in a, in a cell phone No, no, but uh, th those are below, see, uh, those are between 700 to 2.5 gig, right. you see. Uh, it's much easier. Uh, but here we are looking at disparate bands with different technologies, with different propagation characteristics. How do you put all together in one radio? Do we need to? That's the question. So, uh, for some cases, I can see also, you know, there's different categories. Again, maybe you are, you, anyway, you're going to have uh, for the foreseeable future, the below six gigahertz as an anchor, probably covering the mobility mm -hmm. and handover, all these uh, radio resource management aspects. And you have these uh, millimeter wave, you know, becoming a, a data pipe for hotspot cases mm -hmm. where you can't reach those millimeter wave base stations. And, uh, it, you know, def definitely we, we won't need at least one support of one millimeter wave band, but support of multiple of them is, is also, we need to think about it. It's not just a technology issue, but also economic issue. But it's doable. It's doable. You can build multi-band <laughs> okay. millimeter wave antennas. And okay, physical. I'll come to uh, Samsung and NYU to <laughs> do that, you'll see. So I have five minutes left, I have to run. You'll see, one more question over there. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, t I'll answer first because we did a lot of measurements in, uh, in Manhattan in 2012 and uh, uh, it looks like modest power, one watt, modest antenna gains, 20 dB, uh, 200 meter uh, cell radius is doable, very doable, and that's with, uh, you know, not terrible sophistication. What do you think, Charlie? You've done a lot of work at Samsung. Actually, I, I didn't get quite get the question. So, what is the, uh, so the question is, what is the range of a millimeter wave system? What kind of cell size? And the second, what will be the density of the cell, cells in a millimeter wave system? It can be low or high. I don't distinguish between those two because I think the coverage will be same for 28 and 72 because for the same radio aperture, you can fit in more antennas than 72. So, we can recover the path loss. So, that is the question. I see. Mm -hmm. um. <laughs> range cell density. <laughs> So it looks like Abhitabha already answered the question. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with 200 meters, you agree? Yeah. I think 200 meters seem to be... 200 meters... Uh, I, I think so because uh, I can answer that question because we have sort of uh, deployed it in the sense that if you are in a street intersection, you can put multiple access point in the intersection so that if you are blocked by one, you can get covered by other. So that is the main theory, you see. You have to have always access to multiple base station and you design your access point that way. So it is in-band backhaul and you need fast rerouting, that's correct. Yes. If anybody disagrees with me, you need fast <laughs> To go. <laughs> yes, we have to disagree with you so you can stay here longer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'll, uh, five minutes, I have to run. So when we'll see the deployment of the first 5G centimeter wave system and the first 5G millimeter wave system, quick, years being recorded. Okay, 
I'm going to just do the millimeter wave. Late 2017, you're going to hear a lot of press release, and 2018, first customers. Okay, Charlie. Yes, yeah, similar timeline, 2018. It's a trial, at least, commercial trial. Okay. Uh, I work for a Japanese company, so 2020 might be a good day. <laughs> commercial, 2020 yeah. plus. Millimeter wave. Yes. Oh, that's aggressive. Commercial. Huh? Commercial, that's 20, aggressive. 20, 20 plus. Oh, okay. means later. <laughs> no, 20, 20 plus is big. <laughs> yeah. difference. <laughs> well, we have millimeter wave commercial today mm. with, you know, AD. Yeah, yeah, but it is for small range, you see. Yeah, yeah. of course. <laughs> Every, everything is being recorded, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And the last question, last questions, and then I have to really run. <laughs> and uh, Gerard is depending upon me. He is, uh, so are there opportunities for new innovative companies to compete in this space? Last question, guys. Of course. Yeah. So, um, so these innovative companies will eat the lunch out of the operators? Well, you know, remember, remember a, a f company called Flareon, which had this crazy OFDM idea? <laughs> yeah, they and, were uh, bought by uh, Qualcomm. And then, and then uh, Qualcomm bought them, and then uh, look what happened to 4G uh, you know, a few years later. I hope something like that happens with 5G. I hope there's a couple of companies that come up with some radical new approach, and we could see that in the next 24 months. I hope we do. Any, any closing thoughts on that? No, I think from my perspective, I think there obviously is a new air interface with many different... Uh, opportunities ranging from millimeter wave to massive IoT. I think there is plenty of opportunities for innovation and new players to, to come. So do you think I can start a new startup oh, in this you, area? You should. I, I can make money out of that? Yeah, of course. Especially if you, if if you miss your flight, you can. <laughs> <laughs> if you're willing to miss your cab, you could do it. <laughs> OK, last questions to the panelists. cost. <laughs> Delay in public policy, making clarity on where the investments can and should be. Yeah. Spectrum definitely is a key thing. Yep, spectrum. So thank you again for the great panel. With that, I give a big hand to the panelists. It was a great panel, by the way. And I could have continued, except I have to miss my flight. Thank you. <laughs> All right, don't worry, I have an Uber for you. Sorry. Five minutes. Great. All right, uh, just uh, before everyone leaves really quickly, uh, let's just thank Amitav and the panel for the great panel. Um, Robert and I also just like to say a couple, a few quick thanks. Um, thanks to Blanton, Blanton, superior venue, great AV. Thank you to Lily and her staff. We'd also like um, to uh, thank RCR Wireless for streaming this and preserving it for us posterity so we can see how wrong these guys were later. Um, and I'd really like to thank a, the, a, a team of one, uh, Lauren Bringle, who ran this event, you know, did the work of three or four people to bring this event to fruition, and I think it went off seamlessly. So Lauren, you're in the back. This is who we really owe thanks to. Thank you. All right, so thank you. Well, please do join us for some uh, beer and wine um, outside or a soft drink or whatever and, and hang out and talk and uh, discuss all the insights of the day.